with our webinar. Thank you for joining us. We have over 200 people attending right now. A few important notes. You may briefly lose audio during the webinar. Hopefully, it will last less than one minute. But don't be surprised if you do briefly lose audio. I will note that this training was developed specifically for storm spotters in the Norman warning area, the National Weather Service Norman warning area. You can see that on the map there, the western two-thirds of Oklahoma and then western North Texas, including Wichita Falls area. So it includes information specific to our office and the challenges spotters face in our area. Nevertheless, if you are outside our area, there's definitely some useful information and hopefully some good severe weather education that you'll get out of this presentation. All right, we really need to know how many people are attending our webinar. So please, in the questions tab, Tell us how many people are attending the training with you, including you. Just put a number, put the total number of people in the questions box. I'll give you guys about one minute or so. Again, how many people are attending the training with you, including you, and put the total number of people in the questions box. I know a lot of times emergency managers, City officials may have several people in attendance with them watching the webinar. So if you can, please tell us how many people. You just have to put a number. Awesome. We'll give you guys uh, about 30 more seconds or so. Again, we really appreciate this information. It helps us. Just know how many people total attended our webinar. All right. A lot of times people ask us if they're going to have a certificate. Yes, we will email you a blank certificate, which you can print out and put your name. So if you have several people attending, you can print out several copies and that will be useful for you if you want that. Again, it may take a few days for that certificate to arrive though. So yes, you will get a certificate, but give it some time. It'll be sent to the email address you registered for this webinar. So if you need a certificate, again, you'll get it in a few days via the email that you got to sign up. If you need CLEAT credit, so this is for law enforcement in the state of Oklahoma, if you need CLEAT credit, please provide your name, agency, and your CLEAT number in the questions box. Again, if this applies to you, if you need CLEAT credit for this, please include the following information. Again, make sure you have your name. You need to include your agency and your CLEAT number. So make sure you have your agency and CLEAT number there. So we can't give you CLEAT credit unless you provide all three pieces of information. All right, thank you. All right, well, as many of you may know, you've taken the basic spotter training, but the bottom line is storm spotting is challenging. There's a lot of components to thunderstorms, and this is a very busy diagram here with all the different parts of a supercell storm, and we're going to talk about a lot of these parts today. So at the National Weather Service office, we know that there's a storm. We think it's producing or about to produce severe weather, but we need you to tell us really what's happening at the ground.
So why is this the case? Well, here's a graphic demonstrating the important role of storm spotters. Highlighted in yellow are the radar elevation slices that the radar sees. These are the portions of the storm that warning forecasters see. Again, this is because the Earth is curved. So the farther you get away from the radar, the higher you're scanning in the atmosphere. Spotters are in a unique position to view any features that are highlighted here in red that may be reaching the ground. So you guys basically fill in that area below the radar beam. So making a warning decision, there's a lot of pieces that go into it. We look at radar data, spotter reports, the environment, conceptual models, storm history, forecaster intuition, forecaster experience, potential storm impacts, potential warning impacts. We have to also decide if it's going to be a severe thunderstorm or a tornado warning. When it comes to warnings for severe weather, we basically have two options, severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings. Within the severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings, we have different, we call tags. So we have radar indicated, we have observed. We also have tags that describe the intensity, such as considerable tag, destructive tag, we also have the tornado possible tag for severe thunderstorm warnings. For tornado warnings, we have radar indicated, observed, considerable, and then catastrophic. Sometimes that catastrophic is known as the tornado emergency. But you'll notice for both severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings, we have an option for observed weather. So this is why we need the reports. People are more likely to take action for our warnings if it is observed. People are more likely to say take shelter for a tornado if it's an observed tornado. And that helps us too making that warning decision, having that ground truth. So this is why storm spotters are important. And because of uh, these different tags, we can actually now trigger cell phones. So if we do 80 mile per hour winds or baseball size hail, that will result in your cell phones going off. So again, these reports are important. If we're getting reports of 80 mile per hour winds or baseball size hail, that's really useful information because if we don't have that in the warning, we can utilize your information to upgrade the warning to the destructive tag and get people's cell phones triggered. Bottom line is storm spotters reports drive the message. Here's an example of a warning where we say a confirmed large and extremely dangerous tornado. And notice the source. We say weather spotters confirm the tornado. So you guys and girls are extremely important. So let's do a quick refresher of what you should report before we get into some of the science. This is kind of our wish list of things that we want you to report. Obviously, tornadoes or signs that one may be developing. So funnel clouds, strongly rotating wall clouds, hail larger than three quarter inch in diameter. So we're talking about penny size or larger. Damaging winds. So these are damage caused by thunderstorm wind gusts or measured wind gusts of more than 50 miles per hour. Flash flooding. Again, this is rapidly rising water into areas that do not typically flood. You know, here in Norman, for example, there are streets that always flood when it rains. We don't need to know about that most of the time. We really want to know the cases where flooding that doesn't typically happen. Does that street never flood when it rains? If it's flooding, we really need to know that information. So what is a severe thunderstorm? Well, that's hail one inch or larger or winds of 58 miles per hour or higher. Now you may not be able to measure that hail size 
or that wind gust, but if you have hail damage or wind damage, that's usually sufficient enough to also indicate that there was a severe thunderstorm. Because if you look at that car on the left, it would take some pretty large hail to get that type of damage or some pretty strong winds to get that damage on the right with those power poles that are over the road. So even if you don't see the hail or if you don't even you know, experience the wind, we still want to know about the damage, whether it's a hail damage or wind damage, because that tells us that there likely was a severe thunderstorm. So here's kind of a list of things to report and not to report. You don't need to report heavy rain or rainfall rates. We can see on the radar that, yes, there is heavy rainfall occurring. But if you have actual rain amounts, so say you have five inches of rain in your rain gauge, that's useful information. But we don't need to know that you're seeing one inch instantaneous rainfall rates. You don't need to report power outages because we don't know what's causing those power outages. It could be due to wind, but it could also be to, due to lightning as well. But if you see damage to lines and poles, please report that information to us. You don't need to report lightning. We can usually detect lightning using our satellite or lightning networks. We usually know if there's lightning occurring with the storm, but if there's fire or damage from lightning, please let us know. You also don't need to report scary looking clouds, what you see on the radar or TV, or if you're hearing the sirens. That isn't really useful information for us. When reporting, you want to report what, so what is what, what did you see, tornado, hail, wind, flooding, etc. When, if you don't tell us when, usually we assume it's happening now. But again, if it would happen earlier, please tell us and try to be as specific as possible. Where, so where did it happen? And then how, you know, was it a measured wind gust? or was it estimated, and then any key details of what type of building may have seen damage, or what type of structure, that's really useful information. One key thing I wanna mention about the where as well, we wanna know where you are and where did it happen. For example, if it's a tornado, hopefully the where is not the same. <laughs> you don't wanna say there's a tornado and I'm in it. I, we don't want that to happen. So you just have to say, I'm five miles to the south. I see the tornado about you know, five miles to the south of my current location, something like that. So again, when reporting location, we want to find things that are easy to see on the map. So we want to see nearest major intersections. Contrary to popular belief, we don't know every county road in our area. So you want to try to find locations that we know. Avoid references only locals would know or understand, if that makes sense. And someone's reporting no audio, just checking. Can somebody hear me out there? OK, people can hear me. Awesome. Just checking. So avoid references only locals will understand. I mean, if you give us a county streets, we'll take that information, but it's a lot more useful to say, you know, I'm at the intersection, you know, a 74, near the intersection of 74B and 76, or near the intersection of 39 and 76, something like that, instead of saying, you know, I'm on County Road 1040 and 2250, you know, or saying, two miles west of Washington. Something like that is a lot more useful for us. That allows us to easily figure out what storm you're talking about. And as I mentioned earlier, for tornadoes, funnel clouds, wall clouds, you want to provide your location and the estimated location, the feature. Like I said earlier, earlier, please don't let that be the same location. We don't want a tornado or funnel cloud or wall cloud to be the same location that you're at. 
Again, estimate versus measure. You know, we'll take any report you can get, but if you have a ruler, you know, that's awesome. That makes it a lot easier. If you want to get bonus points, look at the bottom right, a caliper right there to measure. <laughs> we don't expect that, but hey, if you provide that, that's awesome. But if you do provide an estimate, please try to put some sort of object next to it, right? Because if you're just having a picture with your hand, we don't know how big your hand is. Or it could be a child's hand. It could be a you know six foot, <laughs> seven foot inch guy's hand, we just don't know. So put something, a golf ball, a quarter, you see a lime there, that at least provides a little bit of context for us because if you just put it in your hand, we have to kind of guess and you know that makes it even a bigger estimate, but you know, having something next to it really helps us. When reporting hail, you want to report the largest size stone that you see. So you know when we do our warnings, we try to predict the largest hailstone. So try to find the largest one and report that. Again, if you're estimating, you want to use a typical size. Now, I know coins are becoming a little less common. A lot of people probably don't even know what a half dollar is anymore. But, you know, coins, at least people kind of know what they look like. So you've got dimes, nickels, quarters, half dollars, ping pongs, golf balls, I'm not a big fan of using fruit like limes because you know limes can kind of vary in size, but hey, it's better than nothing. Tennis ball, baseball, teacup, grapefruit, and hopefully you won't see softball, but if you do, you know, just let us know. Obviously, when you're making these reports, do it safely. We don't want you to run out into softball size hail. Do it safely once the storm is passed, and you can get that report to us. If you happen to get giant hail, and again, we hope you don't, but if you happen to, like they had in Ada just a few weeks ago, this is a picture from March 14th of this year in Ada where they had about a six inch hailstone. If you happen to get what we call near record hailstones, this is approaching, you know, six, seven inch hailstones. So if you have a six inch hailstone or larger, We'd like to know about it if you can safely document it. First of all, how to document it? You want to first wait until the hail stops. Take pictures before you move it. Put a ruler next to it for perspective. You want to avoid handling it with bare hands. Wear gloves, use a towel or tongs because your bare hands will cause it to melt a little bit. So Try to safely remove that hailstone with your gloves or a towel. You want to measure the diameter where it's the widest, and then put the stone, single stone in a Ziploc bag and put it in a freezer as soon as possible, and then call our office. And then we may actually send a meteorologist from our office down to you know retrieve and document that hailstone. But Again, we hope you don't see this, but if you happen to get a hailstone that's, again, six inches or larger, please kind of follow this to kind of get an idea to how to save it, essentially, so we can have an idea of how big it was. Now, estimating wind speed is a lot more difficult than hail size. A lot of times people overestimate wind. so. These are kind of ways you can sort of estimate the wind speed. For example, if you're starting to see damage to TV antennas, large branches breaking off trees, you're starting to get into severe thunderstorm warning winds, so 55 to 72 miles an hour. Once you start getting surfaces of roofs peeled, windows broken, trailer homes overturned, we're talking about hurricane force winds, which are about 74 miles an hour or stronger. And then when you're starting to see winds that are over 113 miles an hour, you're starting to get roofs blown from houses, weak buildings and trailer homes destroyed, large trees uprooted, and train cars blown off tracks. So when you're trying to estimate wind speeds, think about what you're seeing and feeling. If you're just feeling winds that are impeding your walking, 
probably is not severe winds unless you're starting to see some damage to antennas or large branches breaking off trees. Again, here's some pictures of wind damage. Again, we'd like to know it in real time, but obviously after the fact is still useful when you're reporting it, give us a location, the time that you think the wind damage occurred, if you know, description of the damage, any images are really, really useful. We really need the images. And if you have video of the damage, that's also useful. But, you know, don't assume it's a tornado. You Straight line winds can produce damage equivalent to a low end tornado, an EF0 or an EF1 tornado. I've seen straight line winds produce winds, you know, approaching or exceeding 100 miles an hour. So just because you had wind damage, you can't assume it was a tornado. Straight line winds can produce that as well. The bottom line is wind is wind, whether it's straight line winds or tornadic winds. It's all wind. All right, flooding. When you're reporting flooding, be careful. For example, this picture here, we don't need to know that. That's just a little bit of, you know, ponding in your lawn. That's not really flooding that's impactful. This, you know, this is something you can report saying that, you know, water's coming halfway up the tires. And you can tell us what street and intersection. And if you know if it's a typical place that floods, let us know. If it's some place that never floods, that's really even more important. Let us know that information. Here's another picture right here. Again, this is really useful information. If you could tell us it's flooding, but not only that, but tell us the water is up halfway to three quarters up on people's tires, that's really useful information as well. And if there's any cars stranded, that's obviously important information as well. Or if water's flowing across a road like this example, let us know that. And obviously don't drive in this situation either because you don't know how deep that water is. So how to report? You can call us. We have a phone line here 24 seven. Obviously make sure it's an important report because you know we don't want to report that you're giving us that may not be important, preventing someone else to give us a report. But again, give us a report, 405-325-3816. Here's an example. You can say, this is Rick Smith. I'm a trained spotter. I'm in Newcastle on Highway 9, three miles west of I-35. We have two-inch hail falling at the current time. So you have the what, two-inch hail, the time, current time, the location, who you are, all the important information there clear, concise, and make sure you're calm too. Spotter Network is another great way to give reports. You can sign up for an account at spotternetwork.org. Cool thing about Spotter Network, you can connect that to, I think, apps on your phone. Several apps have that, I think, implemented. And with that, you can actually use a GPS on your phone so you have precise latitude and longitude information. So it automatically provides your location there. Amateur radio, you know, that may not be continuously monitored in our office, but most local reports are relayed to the NWS through the local net controller via radio or NWS chat. So a lot of times these net controllers get these reports in their local area and they relay it to us through this internal chat that we have. So yes, amateur radio is still an awesome way to give us reports. It may not be directly talking to us, but these net controllers will give us that information. Someone asked, can we text that number? Unfortunately, we cannot receive texts on that number. So you'll have to just call us on that number. That's a good question though. Another great way to give us reports, especially for hail, is mping this is a app you can download on your phone 
and you basically again use the GPS on your phone and you can give us you know the hail size directly there so uh, I really encourage you to use this we use this quite a bit in our office to look at get reports and ping just look for it in your app or Google Play Store and you can submit again what hail size you're getting at your location social media you know is not the best way but if you are going to do it use Twitter or X so you know formerly known as Twitter but now X that is better than Facebook because Facebook as many of you who have Facebook it is hard to kind of see stuff in real time if you are going to do Twitter please tag us at NWS Norman include the what where when and picture if you can do safely obviously the picture is really really useful but only if you can do it safely so hopefully that was a good review if you've taken our basic spotter training you had an idea hopefully had an idea how to give reports but obviously we wanted to kind of review that so now let's talk about severe weather and meteorology so we're going to go a little bit more in depth than we do in the basic training to kind of talk about the ingredients that we need for severe weather and basically there's four ingredients moisture instability lift and wind shear so we'll start out with moisture in our part of the world across Oklahoma and North Texas our primary source of moisture is the Gulf of Mexico so usually when we have severe weather we have a wind coming from the south so wind coming from the south to the north so we call that a south wind bringing in that Gulf moisture we usually don't have much severe weather with a north wind I mean we can usually if that happens it's more of a hail threat but in terms of tornado threat and other threats like damaging winds it tends to be associated with the south or southeast wind how do we measure moisture well we use something called dew point and for supercells usually you need a dew point around 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit for tornadic supercells you know often it's a little bit higher but again these are just thresholds you could have a tornadic supercell with dew points of 50 so this is from May 10th, 2010. Some of you may know this date. We had a tornado outbreak across central Oklahoma. The little blue lines that tells you these are wind barbs, tells you which direction the wind is coming from. In this case, the wind is coming from the south. So this is a southerly wind. So we had dew points in this case in the 60s. When it comes to tornadoes, low level moisture is important. Abundant low level moisture results in higher instability in the low levels, basically supports stronger and more persistent updrafts. And again, like I mentioned, south or southeasterly winds is what we get for our uh, damage tornado risk here usually south southeast winds across the southern plains that's what transports that moisture northward usually another way we can measure this is dew point depressions this is the difference between the temperature and dew point essentially that results in lower cloud blade bases we call that lcls and tornado formation so again more moisture lower lcls or lower cloud bases more favorable for tornadoes Here's another example. In this case, we had a temperature of 90 degrees with a dew point of 68 in Oklahoma City. This had an instability value, something we call CAPE of over 3,300 joules per kilogram, and we had several tornadoes in central Oklahoma on this particular day. But remember, this is just one key ingredient. Another key ingredient is instability. Let's talk about this. When we talk about instability, we mean is the atmosphere stable or unstable? If the temperature is near the ground or somewhat cool, 
and it's warm above that, this is what we call a stable air mass. Essentially, will a balloon filled with cold air rise? And the key part to remember is cold air is more dense, heavier than warm air. So since it's more dense, essentially what will happen is that balloon will come back down. So that's stable. It's difficult to get thunderstorms when it's cool near the ground and warm above the ground. In contrast, if it's a really warm, humid day, the air is a lot lighter or less dense. In this case, will a balloon fill with warm air rise? Yes, it will. In this case, it's unstable. So a lot of times when we have severe weather, what we have is a lot of warm, humid air, which is lighter, with cold temperatures aloft. That causes instability. If temperatures are too cool, that reduces the instability or results in even no instability. For example, yesterday, temperatures stayed a little bit cooler than originally anticipated for yesterday's severe weather risk across Oklahoma. That resulted in less instability, and that's why the storms, at least one of the reasons we think the storms were not as severe as they could have been yesterday, because the temperatures did not heat up as much due to all the cloud cover. So the atmosphere was not as unstable. You may have heard the term the cap. Well, the cap is essentially a lid or an area of warm air aloft that prevents thunderstorms from developing. Essentially, until you have something that can break the cap, so a cold front or a dry line to help force that air up, or if it gets really, really hot and humid, warm enough where that where it's very warm near the ground, it's difficult to get, difficult to get thunderstorms. So you may have seen something called a weather balloon data or upper air data. These are sometimes plotted on a diagram called the skew T diagram. In the red, we have the temperature of the environment. So this is what the temperature of the atmosphere is. In yellow is the temperature of the bubble of air as it rises. So that balloon I was talking about. And this bubble of air cools as it rises. Why does it cool as it rises? Well, as you go higher and higher in the atmosphere, pressure decreases. Because the pressure is decreasing, that parcel of air or that balloon is expanding. There's less weight above that balloon. And because that balloon is expanding, the air molecules are not bouncing upon each other as quickly. So essentially, the temperature is decreasing because the air molecules aren't hitting each other as quickly because they're just getting farther apart. So the bubble of air cools as it rises. The green air, green line, is the dew point of the environment. So the yellow line there, the area between that yellow line, the temperature of the bubble of air, and the temperature of environment is what we call CAPE. It's a measure of the potential energy or the instability in the atmosphere. So if that bubble of air is a lot warmer than the environment, you're going to have more instability, for example. The bottom line is you need warmer temperatures near the ground and cooler temperatures above the ground to get more instability. Here's another example there. So the black line, that's the temperature of the balloon. The red line is the temperature of the environment. So on the bottom, you'll notice that the red is to the right of the black. That means that the environment 
is warmer than the balloon. That means the balloon is colder and it's going to sink back down. That's essentially what we call convective inhibition or the cap right there. Once you get above that, the black line is now to the right. That means the balloon is warmer than the environment. That means it's less dense and it's going to rise. That's the potential instability. And to break that cap, you either have to warm temperatures near the ground or you have to have some sort of feature to lift the air above the cap. So for example, a cold front. Yesterday we had a cold front that went through Oklahoma and that helped lift the cap. Or at least lift the air above the cap, if that makes sense. So that's instability. Another item that you need is some sort of convergence at the surface. Because when air converges, it can't go down to the ground. What happens is it rises. And this is also called lift. It's basically something to give a nudge upward. Okay, this may include features like fronts, cold fronts, warm fronts, dry lines, outflow from thunderstorms. Essentially, lift from the outflow is generated by a thunderstorm itself. Sometimes solar heating could be enough lift as well. So again, warm fronts at the top, cold fronts at the bottom. With the warm front, air rises more gradually. This usually leads to more widespread but lighter precipitations sometimes well ahead of the cold front, ahead of the warm front rather. Cold front, air rises more abruptly along the cold front, usually leads to a narrow area of heavier precipitation and thunderstorms. So usually cold fronts is where you see those squall lines, those big lines of thunderstorms that moves through because it's a more abrupt rise of air. Again, sometimes solar heating is all you need. Some land areas heat up faster than others, creating localized areas of warm air. The warmer air rises and the surrounding air will move in to fill in its place, creating surface convergence. And like I said, air can only go up, can't go down into the ground. As air, surrounding air converges, it has nowhere to go up but, but up, increasing the lift. And if enough moisture is present, then clouds and eventually precipitation can form. Because like I said, as air rises, it cools. As it cools, eventually it may condense into a cloud. Just like when you take a soda can out of the fridge and you bring it out into a warm environment, you'll see condensation around that soda can. That's because the air, you know, essentially is cooling right in close proximity to the soda can and that cooling at, at one point it reaches the dew point and it then condenses into water similar concept is that balloon rises cools and eventually you get that condensation if there's enough moisture in the atmosphere yes that's what can cause summertime storms especially in the southeast united states solar heating and even here when it gets really hot in the summer if you have enough moisture sometimes all you need is just heating to get thunderstorms in the summertime that's a good question what we typically see for you know severe weather and tornadic weather in our part of the world is usually a dry line this is a boundary between dry air to the west moisture to the east usually winds are from the west or southwest behind a dry line and they're from the southeast east of a dry line so what happens you have westerlies heading hitting easterlies air has to go up and you get thunderstorms to develop this again is from may 24th 2011 if you've been in oklahoma for a while this was another tornado outbreak
And we had tornadic supercells that developed across the west and moved in towards central Oklahoma on May 24th, 2011. So outflow boundary example here. Sometimes when thunderstorms collapse, you get a boundary to come out of those thunderstorms. That's what we call an outflow boundary. Basically acts like a mini cold front. Cold outflow pushes away from the storm, creating a boundary. And that boundary can result in new thunderstorm development because you have a zone of lift and the potential for new development along and behind the boundary. And this happens a lot in the summertime. You see a thunderstorm collapse, the outflow from that thunderstorm produces another thunderstorm in close proximity. All right, the next ingredient is wind shear. This is important for supercells. And what is wind shear? Well, that's increasing wind speed and or direction with height. You need deep wind shear for supercells, but you also need low-level wind shear for tornadoes. So in this example here, you have upper-level winds moving in the different direction the low level winds because the clouds are moving in different directions and that causes wind shear wind shear can be calculated in three ways change in wind speed with height which is shown on number one number two change in wind direction with height number three change in both wind direction both speed and wind direction with height. So number three is the most common. Usually we don't have number one where it's just wind speed with height or number two, just wind direction with height. Usually we have both direction and speed changing with height. Usually we have southeasterly winds near the ground becoming westerly or southwesterly above the ground. So for shear for supercell storms, do the winds change in direction and speed as you move up from the bottom of the sounding up to about what we call a 500 millibar level. So we're talking, you know, 15,000 feet or so. In this example, we have south to southeasterly winds at low levels. So the wind barb again tells you the direction the wind is coming from. The little barb at the end tells you the direction the wind is coming from. And the long barb means 10, and the small barb means 5. So we're talking about 15 knot winds from the southeast. If you go up to 500 millibars, the little flag there means 50. So you've got about 65 or so mile per hour, 65, 70, about 70 knot winds at about 500 millibars, maybe about 75 knots or so. So you have both a change in wind direction and speed with height. For tornadoes, we want to look at the lowest half mile or so it's from the surface to just above the surface. How are the winds changing? In this case, yes, we have southeast winds at about 15, like I said, but even, you know, half a mile or so, the winds become southerly at about 40 knots. So you're going from 15 knots from the southeast to southerly at 40 knots. So you do have a change in wind speed in direction in the lowest half mile to mile or so. So there's a sharp change in speed and direction in the first half mile. And this was May 10th, 2010. This produced a tornado outbreak here in central Oklahoma. So why is wind shear important? Let's start look at this diagram here. So if we have southeasterly winds at the surface, so these little arrows tell you the direction the wind is coming from. And this is a kind of a three-dimensional view. So you're looking to the north, into the screen, south, out of the screen, west is to the left, east is to the right. So you have southeasterly winds becoming westerly winds there. So they're increasing in height and speed 
and they're also changing direction as you go at height as well. And if you imagine if you're putting a little pinwheel in there, that's going to start rotating in the horizontal. And then if you put a little thunderstorm updraft, that will tilt that pinwheel up into the vertical. And that is how you get your supercell rotation or mesocyclone to develop. That wind shear causes horizontal rotation, which is tilted up into the vertical by an updraft. So this is why wind shear is critical for the development of supercells. If you remember from your basic spot or training, a supercell is defined as having a persistent rotating updraft or mesocyclone. A mesocyclone increases the tornado potential, but does not guarantee one. For tornadoes, you want to have a high amount of low-level wind shear, especially the lowest one kilometer. So usually surface winds becoming more easterly. We call that sometimes the backing of the surface winds often increases the low wind shear. Because if you have easterly flow at low levels, with usually southwest or westerly flow aloft, you have a lot more you know, wind shear. Or if you have just easterly winds at the surface and then maybe half a mile do southerly winds, that also would increase the wind shear because you're going from east wind to a southerly wind in a very short distance. So if your winds back become more easterly, that can often indicate an increasing risk of tornadoes. Tornadoes are also more likely along boundaries, such as outflow, because you just enhance that low-level wind shear. So tornado genesis is more likely if a supercell travels parallel along the boundary. And sometimes that storm-scale environment may compensate for a lack of larger-scale environmental conditions. The large scale may not be favorable for tornadoes, but if a supercell tracks near an outflow boundary or something that can enhance the shear, that could reduce, increase the potential and re result in a tornado. Often what we see in our part of the world is what we call the low-level jet, which is strong low-level winds just above the surface. So winds at about 3,500 feet, so less than a mile. If you have weak winds near the surface, say easterly winds, and those winds turn with height, that will increase the low-level shear due to the low-level jet. So sometimes the tornado potential can increase in the evening when the low-level jet strengthens. So let's put this together for a real case. This is a case that affected Seminole, Oklahoma on May 4th, 2022, so a couple of years ago. Let's look at the large scale weather pattern that occurred on this day. This is what we call the synoptic scale setup. This is water vapor imagery, which depicts the motion of the water vapor in the middle part of the atmosphere. So we're talking about 20,000 feet above the surface. Water vapor imagery is useful for identifying features aloft, such as jet stream and sources of descent or lift. So you can look at this animation here, maybe a little bit difficult to see. But at the surface, what we had is we actually had an area of low pressure in the Texas Panhandle. Where there's a war front across Oklahoma near the I-40 corridor, as depicted by the red line. The dry line was much farther to the west across the Texas Panhandle, as shown by the dotted blue line there. And then we had a cold front much farther to the west across New Mexico and Arizona, and that is a kind of a black line there. And these features, again, were connected to the surface low in the Texas panhandle. Along and south of this area, this is called the warm sector. And I want to emphasize this was not our typical dry line or cold front severe weather event. This was a warm sector event for central and east central Oklahoma. The dry line was much farther to the west now, dry line thunderstorms did occur in the Texas Panhandle, which eventually moved into western North Texas and produced a tornado near Lockett, Texas, on this particular day. 
But if you look at this animation, you do notice a counterclockwise rotation in the water vapor imagery centered across southwest Colorado. This is an upper level area of low pressure associated with an upper level trough in a jet stream. Ahead of this feature, lift was overspreading the southern plains, and the source of lift helped prepare the atmosphere for severe thunderstorms on this day by making the atmosphere more unstable aloft. Remember, it's not just meteorological features at the surface that play a role for severe weather. So let's dive in closer to look at the evolution of the surface features. I've plotted the surface observations from our friends at the Oklahoma Mezzanine at three o'clock that afternoon. The top number is temperature, while the bottom number is dew point. So that's a measure, of, again, of moisture that's present. The wind barb tells us the wind direction, in other words, the direction the wind is coming from. So in the ex example key there, the temperature is 78 degrees with a dew point of 70 degrees, and the wind is coming from the southeast. The shaded green to blue colors is the quantity that we call theta E, which you can usually basically say this indicates instability or potential energy for thunderstorms in the atmosphere. So we talked about that earlier. So there was higher instability along and to the south of the warm front, again, which is depicted by that red dotted line. At this time, the temperature at Seminole was only 62 degrees with the warm front at their location. At 4 p.m., the warm front doesn't really move a whole lot. Seminole's temperature is 66 degrees. Again, Seminole is located just to the east of Norman. So Right there, two counties east of Norman, where the 66 over 64 is. That is Seminole. And by 5 p.m., the temperature had risen to 69 degrees. And then by 7 p.m., the temperature was 70 degrees. And again, I have Seminole now circled there. This is less than an hour before a tornado hit Seminole. In early May, our average high is about 75 degrees. So temperatures in this day were actually below average. So in some days, it doesn't have to be very warm for tornadoes to occur. Now, if it was warmer, it likely would have been the worst day than what actually happened. Also, since the temperature and dew point were so close, they were only three degrees apart, this caused the cloud bases to be rather low to the ground. So it was a grungy, cloudy, relatively cool day in Seminole. You know, not your typical severe weather day in Oklahoma. However, this can happen what we call these warm sector events. Finally, you'll notice that the wind direction at this time was from the east. This is because Seminole was in close proximity to the warm front. Again, as I mentioned, this, we refer to this as a backed surface winds. So winds are backed to the east, which enhances the vertical wind shear. Usually in these events, winds aloft are from the southwest to west. So winds were changing direction with height. And if, I, if you remember again, south southeast winds of surface becoming westerly aloft, that is a prime environment for the development of horizontal vorticity that can be tilted into the vertical. So again, low-level vertical wind shear is important for the development of tornadoes. Warm fronts, like in this case, or outflow boundaries can enhance a low-level vertical wind shear by causing a significant change in wind direction within a short vertical distance. In other words, Seminole and the surrounding area being in close proximity to the warm front enhance the vertical wind shear, increasing the potential for tornadoes with any thunderstorms. So Again, they had a tornado that went through Seminole. In this particular case, thunderstorm developed south of a warm front in the warm sector. It's important to note that tornadoes can occur in cloudy, relatively cool weather if the environment's favorable. And because the warm front remained very close to Seminole, easterly winds increase the vertical wind shear. So this is just a real life example in the last couple of years that resulted in a tornado that affected the Seminole area.
So as an example of the combination of importance of the ingredients such as moisture, lift, and wind shear in producing a tornado. All right. In this section, we'll be discussing storm structure evolution, which will build upon the previous part of the presentation. You know, as a storm spotter, you'll encounter a lot of different kinds of storms. You know, meteorologists who study thunderstorms have tried to classify these and label them according to their type. Just about any type of thunderstorm can produce severe weather, but the most dangerous, again, occurs with supercell storms. A supercell is a highly organized thunderstorm that is capable of a producing a variety of violent weather. Supercells, like I mentioned earlier, form in atmospheric conditions that help sustain themselves for long periods of time. So their lifetimes they measure in hours instead of minutes, and most significant tornadoes and largest hail usually come from supercell storms. Every thunderstorm comes starts with an updraft. Again, that updraft consists of warm and humid air that rises much like a hot air balloon. The stronger the updraft, the more likely the storm is to produce severe weather. In the most intense storms, the air in an updraft may be over 100 miles an hour. So no matter how powerful an updraft may be, rain and hail will eventually move outside of the strongest updraft, and gravity will bring the rain, cooled air, and precipitation to the ground. Again, this forms the second part of a thunderstorm that we call the downdraft. The downdraft may bring any combination of rain, hail, and strong winds to the ground. And when the downdraft reaches the ground, it has nowhere to go but sideways. So rain cooled, dense air in the downdraft will spread out in all directions. A supercell has an updraft and downdraft, but what makes that supercell special is its rotating updraft, the mesocyclone. This rotation in the storm makes the updraft more intense and helps make the storm more persistent and much more organized. Here we see the top view of an idealized supercell with a depiction on radar. This shows the precipitation location and intensity. The center of the mesocyclone circulation, which is where you'd most likely expect a tornado, is denoted by a letter T. The leading edge of the rain-cooled downdraft air is denoted by the cold front or gust front line. The counterclockwise rotation of the mesocyclone and smaller scale downdraft to the, on the southwest or west side of the thunderstorm is known as a rear flank downdraft or RFD. That's what produces the hook appearance as precipitation wraps around the southwest portion of the circulation. So let's go into more detail. Here's a quick review for the parts of the supercell that you hopefully saw from the Brave Basic Spotter training class. Again, as I go through this animation, we're looking at the top view of a supercell. Every thunderstorm starts with an updraft. Again, this is warm rising air. The stronger the updraft, the more likely the storm is to produce severe weather. Rain and hill eventually move outside the strongest updraft. And that gravity will bring the rain cooled air and precipitation to the ground. Again, this forms the second part of the thunderstorm, the downdraft. Next, we have the flanking line. It's a line of towering cumulus clouds. They're stair stepping up to the main storm tower. New storm cells can develop from the flanking line, which usually extends to the south or southwest of the supercell. Air that's rising up into the base of the thunderstorm, that's again called inflow. This is usually warm and moist air. Contrast that with air rushing out. Of the rainy downdraft. This is what we call outflow. This is usually relatively cold air. Again, the downdraft may bring any combination of rain, hail, and strong winds to the ground. This is the precipitation core of the storm. The leading edge of the rain cooled downdraft air, again, which is called outflow, is denoted by the cold front symbol, and this is called the gust front. As I mentioned earlier, a unique feature of the supercell is a counterclockwise rotation of the mesocyclone and a smaller scale downdraft on the southwest or west side of the thunderstorm known as the RFD, which produces the hook appearance as precipitation is wrapped around the southwest portion of the circulation. This is the classic hook echo you've probably seen on radar. 
finally, when you're storm spotting, you have to be looking what we call the action area. The action area essentially is the interface between that updraft and downdraft of the storm. This is the part of the storm where tornadoes, funnel clouds, wall clouds, as well as the biggest hailstones are likely to form. All storms are different and it won't always be easy to pick out the action area. But if you remember the most serious weather with the supercell is usually very close to the updraft, hopefully that'll help you zero in on the area to watch. By the way, here's what it looks like on radar. This is again the classic hook echo. Many of you are probably familiar with across Oklahoma and North Texas. So let's talk about some specific features. You've got what we call the updraft walt. This is found in the inflow region of the storm and is the transition zone between the strongest updraft and downdraft. It's very close and you could sort of say within the action area of a supercell to just the south or southwest of the walt is where you may see a tornado. This is a dangerous part of the storm because not only can you be close to the tornado, this is an area that frequently has active lightning and giant hail. Again, usually to the south or southwest of the vault, you have the rain-free base. This is essentially the action area right near the interface of the updraft, downdraft region. Within the action area, one of the main visual clues spotters should look for is the wall cloud. The wall cloud is an isolated lowering of the cloud base in the main updraft. The wall cloud forms beneath the main updraft and adjacent to the rainy downdraft. Sometimes the wall cloud can slope toward that rainy downdraft. And how do you know if it's a wall cloud? You want to check to see if it's connected to the cloud base. Is it in the right part of the storm? So again, that action area. And is it sloping down toward the rain? So it doesn't necessarily always have to do that. So some clues for supercells. A lot of times you see striations, stacked plates. That indicates a supercell like in this example here. Again, rain-free base, usually called an updraft base. This is air rising into the storm. Here's a couple examples of that. You see kind of a rounded updraft. Again, that's an indication of the mesocyclone. Again, these are just some clues you need to look for. Here's a picture. If you've ever been to our building at the National Weather Center, this is actually a supercell in close proximity to our building. And you can see the striations there, those kind of stacked plates that indicate the presence of a mesocyclone. These are really important diagrams. Again, Every storm is going to be different, but you always want to look for that action area. You've got the downdraft in this image to the right and the updraft to the left. Again, that precipitation to the right indicates the downdraft. You've got that heavy precipitation coming down to the ground due to gravity. To the left, you have no precipitation because you have rising motion. And between the two there, that is the action area right there. And you can actually see a little lowering within that action area. Again, here's another example. You got an updraft, rain free base, downdraft. Between the two, you've got a wall cloud, maybe even a funnel cloud developing in that action area. So you always want to look between the two. That's showing you several examples because every storm is different. And we should point out that although wall clouds are important, they do not mean that a tornado is guaranteed to happen. Many storms produce wall clouds and nearly all supercells produce wall clouds, but you know very few produce tornadoes. So as a storm spotted, the key is to be patient and observant and monitor the wall cloud for changes. These are some signs that a wall cloud could be about to produce a tornado. Lower to the ground faster rotation, tightening circulation, or increasing inflow. So if you feel warm, moist air moving inward toward that area, if the wall cloud displays one or more of these signs, the storm may be very close to producing a tornado. These are dangerous wall clouds. But there are also cases where, you know, 
Walcott is less likely to produce a tornado, indicating a higher cloud base, weaker rotation, broadening circulation. The bottom line is you want to report the trends. You know, telling us there's a wall cloud is great, but if you want extra credit, please tell us, you know, the trends. Is the wall cloud getting tighter in rotation, lower to the ground, or is it getting higher up, broadening? That's important information for us. You want to report the trends and give us as much information as you can that you know. And like I mentioned, not every supercell will look idealized like in the previous photos. It's important to note that there is a broad spectrum of supercells. And usually we classify them by how much precipitation. You've got low precipitation on the left, we call LP. That means very little precipitation reaching the ground. Classic supercells generate enough precipitation to produce enough downdraft for moderately strong outflow. That's in the center. And you've got high precipitation supercells, which are highly efficient precipitation producers and produce strong downdraft and outflows. These are you know, the most dangerous when it comes to storm spotting because you've got reduced visibility. And if there's a tornado, there's a decent chance it could be rain wrapped. And as a reminder, you know, all supercells are dangerous, but HP1s are just more dangerous because it can be difficult to see what's going on. And in the real atmosphere, it's a continuous spectrum between these types. You know, sometimes you can't tell exactly if it's an HP or LP because the real world, you know, every storm is a little bit different and you have, you're going to have some variations there. Here's the top views of the supercells. Again, LP, you may have little or no hook echo. Classic supercells have more idealized radar structure that you associate with supercells. These produce the majority of long-lived tornadoes. And then HP supercells have a large amount of precipitation that wrap around the mesocyclone, producing a large high reflectivity hook. As I mentioned earlier, there's two types of downdrafts in a supercell. You've got the forward flank, or FFD. This is in the main region of the downdraft in the forward, or leading part of the supercell, where most of the heavy precipitation is falling. So it's usually northeast of the hook. That's that heavy, broad area of precipitation to the northeast of the hook. Sometimes you have strong outflow winds associated with this. You know, when you're storm spotting, you don't want to be looking through or located in the FFD. The heavy precipitation may obscure the tornado depending on the spot or positioning. In other words, it's a dangerous part of the storm to be in due to reduced visibility and the potential to get by large hail and the risk of getting caught off guard. The other downdraft associated with the supercell is what we call the rear flank downdraft or RFD. This is, again, the region on the backside wrapping around the mesocyclone. It's often visible as a clear slot wrapping around the wall cloud. Again, this is what you see as the hook on radar. RFD can have really strong winds in excess of 100 miles an hour. It may cause more significant damage than the tornado itself. And here's an example of that clear slot wrapping around right there. And again, tornadoes typically occur north of the RFD and clear slot. Now, RFDs can be wet or dry, but in many cases are kind of a hybrid between the two. When it comes to the development of tornadoes, the temperature and associated buoyancy of the RFD has been found to be important to take into account. So all things equal, if RFD is relatively warm and buoyant, that supercell is more likely to produce a tornado than a supercell with a cold and stable RFD. Here's a diagram from a paper from Marquise et al. to 2012 that describes the potential importance of RFD temperature. Again, the research indicates there's an optimal balance where there's enough cool air to produce low-level rotation, but not so cold to weaken the updraft and thus prevent tornado genesis. So as a storm spotter, you know, observing if the RFD is relatively warm or cool versus very cold is important. If you have a really cold RFD, tornadoes are less likely. Again, the mesocyclone is the defining characteristic of a supercell, vertically oriented rotating updraft. 
see examples here. We have all those little striations there. Again, it develops, well, because again, because the vertical wind shear creates horizontal tube that's tilted up into the vertical. This rotating column is stretched, causing it to spin faster. This is, again, why vertical wind shear is important in the development of supercell storms. All right, it is 7.40, so we will come back at about 10 minutes or so, 7.50, and do the second half of this training. So we'll give everyone a little break. There.